Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to begin, of course, by acknowledging and paying my respects uh, to the first Australians uh, on whose lands we meet today. And for us here in Sydney, it's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'm Rosie Hicks. I'm the CEO of the Australian Research Data Commons. The, the ARDC is enabled by the federal government's National Research Infrastructure Strategy, uh, so that's NCRIS. Our mission is to accelerate research and innovation by driving excellence in the creation, analysis, and retention of high quality data assets. So, welcome to the first of the ARDC Leadership Series. Today's topic forum, sharing sensitive and identifiable human data, is the first of a series of panel discussions that we'll be holding across 2022. And we're aiming at providing decision makers in academia, government and industry with the opportunity to work through some of the data challenges that are impacting Australia's researchers. Access to sensitive and identifiable human data is essential for researchers to gain new insights to understand human health and well-being. By analysing and integrating these data sets, researchers can unlock a wealth of knowledge to drive innovation and positive outcomes for the community. The ARDC is heavily invested in enabling researchers to share sensitive and identifiable human data through a number of initiatives, such as our Health Studies Australian National Data Asset, or HASANDA. This has an initial focus on clinical trials, and we have 72 health research organisations across Australia collaborating to build a national infrastructure to enable researchers to access and share data from health studies. The initiative aims to stimulate new data-driven research ideas, increase the impact of health research, and ultimately improve health and well-being of Australians. No doubt there are many challenges facing researchers working with sensitive data, but the potential benefits of harnessing this data to generate innovative research solutions is enormous. It's timely and an important topic. And I look forward to hearing the various insights of our panel members. And I am very grateful uh, for all of their participation and efforts in joining us here uh, for this afternoon's discussion. I'm going to hand over uh, to Professor Joe Schepter, who will lead us through the rest of the afternoon. Thank you, Joe. Great, thanks, Rosie. Um, so I would also like to acknowledge, excuse me, um, the traditional owners of the lands, all the lands, of course, that we're meeting on today, both here in Sydney and, of course, around the country. Uh, my role is as the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research Infrastructure at the University of Queensland, where, of course, this is a particular challenge for us. And in a little while, you'll hear from a UQ researcher who's facing these challenges in a, in a project, and that'll be the case study that you'll hear. Um, I also then sit on a Queensland-wide organization, and we talk about how we're going to share this data. And in fact, I'm also on the board of the ARDC, where we have this national conversation about solving these data challenges. So this is an incredibly important issue that we as a country really have to figure out good ways to solve. So we really would like to, I guess, have a very wide-ranging conversation today, but in particular, we really want to think about a few things, one of which Rosie has already highlighted, and that's one simply of access. You know, the good news is, unlike in lots of cases, there is lots of data, right? The challenge now is to make sure it's in the right hands of the right people. The second challenge then, of course, is reusing that data. So just because we collected the data for a certain thing or a certain um, application doesn't, of course, mean that it can't be used for many, many other things. And of course, if you solve the first problem where lots of the right people have access to the data, now you can do new and exciting things with it. Not only do you get new people with new perspectives looking at the data, but now you get all kinds of machine learning opportunities, AI opportunities, and so again, access opens up that reuse possibility. And it would be great to hear people's thoughts about that. Then, of course, I'm going to mention the thing that I'm probably not allowed to mention, 
of course, and that is sort of quote unquote, who owns the data? Okay, we're going to share the data. Who gets to decide what can be shared and what can't be shared? If it does get shared, who owns the data now that somebody did something with it? So again, those are all challenges that we really need to solve, of course, as we go forward to make sure that people understand you know, what they can and can't do with the data and what the outcomes are going to be. We don't want all this work to happen and then it not to have some impact in the real world. So that's going to be really important. So that access, reuse, and understanding who owns the data are some of the key elements that we'd really like to talk about. So the way today is going to work is the first, we, we're very lucky to have some fantastic panelists and you'll hear from them in, in just a second. And then after that, Professor Peter Sawyer, who is online from Adelaide, is going to give you a case study about a project that he's running. And it will highlight a lot of the challenges uh, that exist in this space and that we have to solve. And then after that, we should have about 45 minutes for some Q&A, and we'll certainly do that with people in the room. Uh, and of course, we've got somebody monitoring online. And if you have any questions or comments in the chat function, please put them in, and of course, we'll, we'll make sure they're part of the discussion. So with that, I'm going to turn us, turn us over to the panelists. The panelists have been asked to sort of tell you a little bit about who they are and maybe give you some thoughts in the sensitive data area. So our first speaker is Philip. Oh. Turn over to you, Phil. Yeah, so hello everyone. My name's Philip Gould. I'm the first Assistant Secretary for the Health, Economics and Research Division at the Department of Health. So I've got a really interesting role where I have a lot of people who are actually working right now on fascinating data sets, um, generating insights and uh, learning things that we didn't know beforehand. But I've also got a lot of people working on data governance and in the department, data governance often means working out how we can better share the really important information that we have uh, with the people who need to use it. So I'm going to, I've got a few minutes, I think, um, give you a bit of a kind of narrative arc, I suppose, um, from when I started in the public service 10 years ago to where we are now. Um, Prior to joining the public service, I worked in banking and finance, and that meant using a lot of data, a lot of interest. I'm still really keen to know what the RBA does with rates today. You kind of can't lose that interest in, in, in data. Um, but there, the sensitivity around data was actually paywalls. So we had a lot of providers who had fantastic information that could give you a market edge, but you had to pay for it. And there was a lot of work and a lot of money spent on getting access to, to data via providers like Bloomberg uh, and Lehman Brothers. Um, many of you would have heard what happened to Lehman Brothers in the end, but data was very central to all of that work. And finding the right stuff gave you an edge. I then worked in road safety where I did my PhD doing econometric analysis of road safety. Uh, measures and again data was really central to that work and that was the first time when I came across this idea that information that I knew was clearly in the public benefit uh, was too sensitive to be shared so I wasn't actually able to get hold of information that as a researcher I knew would help my research because it might have potentially led to the identification of um, an individual being involved in a, in a road accident where, for example, drink driving or drug use may have been involved. I found that incredibly frustrating, but I found my way around it and you know, continued on with my work. Fast forward a few years and I decided to move to, to work in the government sector. And I sort of remembered, you know, I knew data was really important and I went to work for the ABS because I knew that I wanted to help people get access to better data because it's a, an extremely valuable uh, resource for, for researchers. And I'll be really honest here, I was absolutely horrified when I arrived at the, the mentality towards data sharing that we had in government. Um, we had people asking us to integrate data sets and we're saying, no, we wouldn't do that, um, to have access to it. No, you can't have access to it. And then lecturing people about the fact that legislation didn't allow data to be shared with researchers. 
So it was a really backward um, view of the world. And I think over the last 10 years, government's come a long way. I still think there's a long way to go, but I think that we should actually say, as a group here of researchers and government people, that a lot has actually been achieved in the last 10 years. We see now the ABS has given um, people access to a lot of really valuable, potentially re-identifiable information, um, often quite sensitive information via their data lab. And we've seen ideas like the five safes approach really actually give government comfort that if they are to provide better access to data, there are proper frameworks for doing that. So we've seen this big shift, but there's room for a lot more, and we've got to work together as a group to help drive that shift. We, we need the research community being able to demonstrate the value of what it can offer through better use of data, and we need a government that's willing to listen and understand what that value is as well. The last thing I'll say is, as part of that shift, I think we saw with COVID a really interesting change in government mentality. And it's this term that, that the, the, the former interim data commissioner, my boss, um, Deb Anton talked about, and I really liked it, which was this idea that government needs to have a sense of a duty to share. So that moves away from a duty only to protect, but also thinking about the potential that data has to do good things and that we as public servants need to think about what we need to do to enable the right people to use data safely and effectively. So that puts the pressure back on us, that duty to share. It's not just about protecting and saying no. And I think if we can keep building on that, and I know that the Department, um, Department of Health, where I work, is adopting that sort of posture, to use a very management consulting word, um, I think that that's going to lead to really great things going ahead. And I ask you as a community, research community, to keep pushing us um, to do better, but also work with us and be constructive. So I guess that's kind of my few words. Terrific, thanks, Philip. Mary? Um, my name is Marion Hemphill and um, I'm the General Counsel and the Chief Privacy Officer for Australian Red Cross Lifeblood. So if you, if you don't know what Lifeblood does, we used to be called um, the Australian Red Cross Blood Service. So we're, um, we provide Australia's blood supply to hospitals. We collect it from donors, we test it um, and process it and then distribute it out um, to Australian patients. We collect about um, one and a half million donations per year. And that, the donation itself, the blood itself, has information within it um, that's very useful. We also test all the blood that we um, collect, and there's a lot of sensitive information that we need to get from the donors that goes along with the donation, which we need to keep for safety purposes. Um, and one thing that we've learned that although we collect information for safety, both for the donor and for the patient, um, the way we collect it and the way we protect it is really important because we run on a social licence and if that licence relies on trust and if we breach the trust of the public and our donors um, that may mean that people do no longer wish to donate and that has real consequences not just for our research programs but really importantly for Australian patients. It might mean that there aren't enough blood donors and there isn't enough blood available and given that one in three Australians are going to um, need um, donation in their lifetime, that could have a really a real world consequence. Um, so, you know, we, we've, we've had experience around um, a, a bump because we did have a major data breach about seven years ago and we were really aware that public trust is hard to get and easy to lose. And if you do lose it, um, it's hard to get it back. So when we did have our data breach, we really focused on transparency and trying to regain that trust. And a big learning that we had when, we, when our donors spoke to us about their information being involved in a data breach was there was a lot of concern about who could access their data. They'd given us data to save a patient's life, not for any other purposes. Even though our consent forms had talked about research and other things as well, it sort of opened people's eyes as to what we might do with that information. And it was really clear that to us that our donors were very worried about third parties, um, particularly things like insurance. 
um, you know, would this, if there was something, because we test blood, um, was there something in their test results around their iron levels, for example, that might prevent them from getting insurance coverage um, uh, a bit further down the track? Some people were worried about uh, police uh, you know, uh, getting hold of that information. Um, as Philip was saying about you know, uh, alcohol levels and that sort of stuff, even though we don't test for it, that seemed to be a real, um, a real concern for people. So you know, we're really focused on trust and making sure that we collect, we're really clear about why we collect it, what we're going to do with it, and, and how long we're going to hold it for. But the thing is, that data is so rich. We could do so much more with it. And we do have quite wide consents where we talk about research and the making of reagents, and it's in the, um, the, the forms that people um, read when they come to donate blood. But how many really uh, get that far with their reading. Um, they've answered lots of questions, they're focused on the stuff about fainting. We're not really sure how much people take in about that, that, that research part of it. So, but we want to use that data because it's so rich. It could benefit the donors as well as the patients because we could, we're doing tests, we could start to tell people a bit about their own uh, health. We could we'll go down the road to pre precision medicine. Um, it could also help society at large. So one of the challenges for our business is to find a way through. Um, and I get asked a lot by our um, internal teams, is it legal? Is there an exemption in the Privacy Act that we can use to use this, even though it might be a little bit outside uh, the, the, norm, the realms of what we collected it for? Is this within reasonable expectation? And I think my teams find me a little frustrating because as a lawyer, I think they expect me to say, yeah, you could, there's no law against it, go right ahead. But because I'm an ethical lawyer, I think the question that we need to be asking my organisation needs to ask, and I'd like us to ask today, is not what can you do, but what should you do, um, and put an ethical framework over the over it. And it might mean that we push out to more accessibility because that's where the scale tips. I could keep going, but I'll pass on. <laughs> Great, thank you. That's fantastic, Mary. Thanks. Okay. Well, I'm Marin Smith. I'm the chief executive of the Population Health Research Network, or PHRN for short. And I'm based at the University of Western Australia on the banks of the beautiful Blue Swan River. Uh, I, I'm particularly interested in sensitive data. It's something that PHRN works with every day. And I put together a couple of slides just by way of background that I think might help the discussion. So uh, as I said, PHRN works with linking sensitive data. Now we're, we're all on life's journey from cradle to grave and information about the health services we receive and, and other human services we receive is collected at each step along that pathway. And of course, we live in a federation, so some of that data is collected by states and territories, and other data is collected by the Commonwealth. And PHRN is able to work with groups around the country to link this data in privacy-preserving ways and making it available for a range of research. And the sort of data we link at the individual person level includes birth data, hospital records, emergency department attendances, cancer registry data, and of course, death records. And this data can then be linked to information held by the Commonwealth, such as the medical benefit schedule data or pharmaceutical benefits data, and aged care veterans affairs data. And of course, immunisations data, which has been enormously important during the pandemic. Um, most of that linkage is done without informed consent, but it is lawful. It's allowable under a whole range of legislation, which unfortunately is not standard across the whole country. And we're also able to link this data with, with other clinical trials data, um, other clinical registries data, and other research data sets. And generally when that happen, happens, that linkage is with informed consent. In terms of the PHRN infrastructure, I won't go into too much detail, but to say that linkage is done at the jurisdictional level. So every state has got a data linkage unit, and they do that linkage based on fully identified data. So they take the name, address, date of birth, and gender of the person to build the linkage map. They don't rely on any particular identifiers because, of course, some of this data is health data and may or may not have a Medicare number on it, but other data such as death data doesn't have a Medicare number on it, so it's not reliant on a particular identifier. 
The other thing we do is provide a secure access environment. So once data has been linked and put together in a linked data set at the individual person level, generally without the identifiers on it, then it can be interrogated within a secure environment and then only the summary data is taken out and the data is actually checked as it leaves that environment. So I think that's quite a helpful uh, mechanism as we're thinking about how you manage sensitive data in the discussion today. Uh, and probably in our experience, just to say we think it's all just important, enormously important that whatever is done with the data is lawful, ethical and acceptable to the community. As you say, trust, community trust is enormously important and we, it, it's, it's, um, it's easily lost and very hard to win back. And informed consent is probably a helpful mechanism. It doesn't have to imply, apply all the time, but where it can apply, it's helpful. Another helpful construct is the five safes, and some of you will have heard about that. So it's safe projects, safe people, safe data, safe settings, and safe outputs. And I've just mentioned a little bit about safe settings and safe outputs in what I said previously about those secure environments. And last but not least, I think accessing health information in Australia in the 21st century is complex, but it can be done. And there's a couple of examples down the bottom of some uses. The first one is around the human papilloma virus vaccination, HPV vaccination. People will, most people probably know that Ian Fraser from the University of Queensland was instrumental in the development of this HPV vaccine. And linked data was used to link the vaccine information with the cervical cytology data and that clearly demonstrated in the population that that vac vaccine was enormously helpful in preventing cervical cancer. Uh, and, and the second example is a vitamin D trial that's currently underway in Queensland and there's over 21,000 patients enrolled in that trial and linked data is being used for five-year follow-up in this case with consent. So that's probably what I wanted to say, just to provide that sort of framework, because I think it will probably be relevant to the later discussion today. Absolutely. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Marin. Um, and our last panelist couldn't be here in the room with us, but I'm hoping Satiris is online and can tell us a little bit about his background and his interest. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me uh, in this panel. I hope you can hear me all right. Uh, yeah, all good. Sorry, I couldn't join you in person, um, but I'm delighted to be part of this discussion. Uh, um, just a brief introduction. I'm, I'm Sotiris Barbulakis. I'm professor of global environmental health at the Australian National University. And uh, I direct the new NHMRC network uh, called HEAL, Healthy Environments and Lives, uh, which, is, uh, which focuses on environmental health, climate change, environmental change, environmental pollution, and other um, environmental and socioeconomic stressors on health uh, in Australia. We try to develop uh, the evidence base and tools that will uh, support uh, decision makers uh, aiming to protect uh, the general population but also vulnerable groups from the effects of climate change, extreme events uh, like bushfires, the floods that we've seen recently, and also uh, issues related to contamination, to unsustainable housing or um, uh, in relation to food security and water security and availability. So the, this, the Hill Network has been funded by NHMRC for five years, and we are starting now, we're starting this month formally. Uh, it's based very strongly on uh, data systems and, and data, uh, uh, and work very closely with data providers uh, from across the country. If we can move to the next slide, please, I'll give you an overview of that. Uh, uh, and I would like, of course, to acknowledge the traditional custodians on, on, of the lands we are based at, the uh, Union Country from here in, in Canberra, but, uh, but across the network we have many Aboriginal uh, and Torres Strait Islander investigators, and, and we're very grateful for, for their contribution to the network, which, uh, which of course, is very strongly based on uh, Indigenous knowledge and, and tradition. N next slide, please. So uh, going back to the aims of the, of the HIL network, uh, as I said, it, it aims to catalyze environmental health research and generate the evidence, uh, the tools and the data which are needed to uh, 
make decisions uh, which will protect uh, the population and particularly at-risk groups from uh, climate change and environmental change in, in, in the urban Australia, rural Australia and remote uh, parts of the country. If we move to the next slide, please. So this, this map gives uh, an overview of the, of the, of the Hill uh, network landscape. Uh, as I said, we rely very heavily on, on data providers and, and collaborators from across the country, um, like the, public, uh, the Population Health Research Network, uh, or the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, and other data providers. And the intention is to, to link available data, environmental and health data, to uh, uh, better uh, identify risk, risk factors and characterize the risk of, of environmental expo exposures to human health. And, and most importantly, identify the solutions that can reduce exposure and improve health and well-being. If we move to the next slide, please. In terms of, uh, of the of uh, health data and, uh, and sensitive environmental health data and how we share that. Uh, there are many challenges and, and many opportunities there. So I would like to highlight that uh, big data are increasingly used in environmental public health research. Uh, and there is clearly a need for good quality data and for data which are uh, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. This is the FAIR framework for, for data uh, and data and data sharing. The ability of using data and uh, analyzing data has increased immensely in recent years. Uh, so currently there are uh, very powerful techniques, uh, computational techniques based on artificial intelligence and machine learning for analyzing data and uh, deriving exposure response relationships which will help us make decisions in terms of uh, 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 in terms of protecting the population from environmental exposures. Uh, this uh, large availability of data and, and computational tools uh, provides opportunities to, uh, to gain knowledge into, uh, into the um, causal relationship between exposures and, and health outcomes. But it also uh, poses a number of risks, and these are related to privacy issues, uh, we have seen in studies, particularly coming from the US, that uh, it has been possible to re-identify data which have been used in exposure uh, in environmental health studies. And, and, and of course, this is, uh, uh, this is potentially very damaging. Uh, it can uh, undermine confidence and, and trust in the research. And, uh, and of course, it can expose individuals. It can cause some stigma and, 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 and um, uh, and even have financial impacts for uh, people involved in studies. Therefore, uh, it's very important to ensure that uh, sensitive information is, is treated as such as sensitive, and we, we ensure that there is no uh, that we protect the data in a way that they cannot be re-identified. I think it's worth saying that uh, this kind of risk has been investigated uh, for a long time in the more traditional genetic and medical research uh, fields, but uh, much less so in the field of environmental health research. And it's increasingly important because uh, the availability of data from, uh, um, from sensors, from uh, uh, exposure studies um, is becoming much larger. So uh, we have access now to data from wearable devices, from uh, mobile monitors, uh, from uh, uh, biomonitoring studies, uh, and, and, and of course, uh, this data could potentially be linked to, uh, uh, to housing characteristics and, and, uh, and the process, as I said, the risk for re-identification. So I will, uh, I will say that, uh, uh, of course, uh, it's important for the data uh, to be open and, uh, and um, uh, share and, and pool for the purpose of uh, improving research and gaining knowledge. Environmental and, and health data are, are expensive to, to collect, and they're expensive, expect, expensive to analyze, so it's important to make the best use of them and, and uh, add value to uh, the research of, uh, uh, to the to research studies which have collected this data, but of course we need to be conscious and uh, of the potential risk of re-identification and uh, make sure that there are no unintended uh, consequences uh, 
for participants of environmental, uh, environmental health studies. So I'll pause here uh, and, and look forward to the discussion in, in this panel. Thank you very much. Terrific, thank you. Looks like a fantastic initiative. Uh, so now I'd like you to turn you over to Peter Sawyer. Peter is joining us from Adelaide, and he is going to present our, our case study. Um, and Peter will tell you a little bit about the project that they're working on, then highlight some of the issues and challenges that they've got. Hi, Peter. Yes, um, thank you so much, Joe, and thank you for in inviting us and, uh, and giving me the opportunity that I present our research uh, project. Uh, this is an ACIF, Australian Cancer Research uh, Foundation funded um, 10 million grant where we got the infrastructure for 15 3D total body imaging systems and it's a collaboration between the University of Queensland, uh, uh, University of Sydney and, and Monash. And just that uh, myself, I'm a, I'm a dermatologist which uh, is obviously I'm here in Australia since 2007 with a lifelong interest in the early uh, diagnosis of melanoma and this is also the reason why I decided to come from Austria to Australia because you guys are leading the world in regard to the incidence of, of, of melanoma. Um, this uh, funding uh, basically uh, is based on a, on, on a technology which is basically 3D total body imaging, looks like a spaceship, 92 cameras, within one second all 92 cameras are shooting and within 12 to 13 minutes with the current computer, the CD uh, total body avatar is built up. I think it's fair to say that these are sensitive data, right? And they are identifiable also. So I, I don't think this needs to be explained. By the way, this, uh, this is one of my collaborators who is also part of our study project and I have his ex written and verbal uh, consent to, to show his, uh, to show him. And uh, the beauty of this uh, system is, of course, that we can study longitudinal data, which is very important, actually, for the early detection of melanoma to understand the biologic ecosystem. But it's also important for inflammatory skin diseases, and uh, we feel very strongly that this will have a place in the future in, uh, uh, in dermatology, particularly for regional and, and remote Australia. I think we are going now into, into the nitty gritty. If you see, we have quite a few boxes here. The overarching idea is to have a, a basically a nationwide research data bank, which is obviously an image data bank with uh, total body imaging and also with individual demoscopy images, but of course we will need clinical data uh, we have done quite a bit of work already with uh, German genetic data, so it's not just imaging data, but the uh, specific aspect of our data set is, is uh, absolutely identifiable. And then you see three other boxes, which basically at the moment represent the three states we are working in. Having said this, one of our big goals is to, to develop a roadmap for a nationwide screening program, and then we will have more states and more territories uh, involved and as you can, and you guys probably know it better than I, that there are different rules for certain things in uh, in Victoria and in uh, New South Wales and in Queensland. For example, what I understand, New South Wales has one pack system in the public system. In Queensland has probably 15 pack systems, right? But on the other hand, we have just one EMR. So it's it's challenges in in, in its own right in each of these centres. Uh, and actually, the data which we are collecting, we are collecting which in the public system, system but also some, uh, some of our systems will, uh, are in the private system, like in the Melanoma Institute of Australia, which is a private non-for-profit uh, hospital. And of course, the data will need to be identified in the conventional way, but in the conventional way is not enough if you're dealing with total body imaging. So there are quite a few problems, as you can imagine, right? how we deal with the various hospital system and each HSS is absolutely independent and then how we deal then with, uh, with a research data bank. Well, originally we thought there would be one research data bank, now I understand that there will be each of the states will have a separate one and, uh, and I mean uh, uh, Ryan Sullivan is, uh, is the, the contact person from uh, 
from Sydney and Paul Bonington, as who I understand is, is in the audience today, is obviously in charge for in, about all this uh, in at Monash. And it's, it's actually a special situation because Monash has a close collaboration, Monash University, with the, uh, with the health system and the Alfred, which is not always the case in, in UQ, where, um, where it's basically a sort of a, a different uh, uh, setting. And David Abrahamson is the, is the senior person from, uh, from UQ in this uh, context. And I understand that Monash and UQ was uh, contemplating about the physical storage, whereas uh, University of Sydney is uh, thinking on the cloud. Uh, anyhow, this is uh, basically, uh, and I come now just to my, to my last uh, slide, which uh, will show up in a second. And uh, Basically, this is uh, the mission statement of our research, basically to transform uh, melanoma early uh, detection using uh, total body surveillance in, to enhance individual uh, lesion management. And we have three major research streams, one about diagnostic intelligence, where, of course, AI will play a major role. And my part will mostly be the annotation of, of the images and link it together from the clinical uh, point of view. Of course, the health service evaluation is a major point. And, and having said this, we have a huge group of, of uh, CIs, and we have health economists, pathologists, we have computer experts. Uh, we have a very broad group of, uh, of uh, expertise in, in, under our researchers. And then, of course, health informatics, which is a big issue of standardization of images, DICOM standards. Um, and, and the idea is obviously to, to, to fund them, uh, basically to build up a network, a, a 3D network or in, in the various uh, places in uh, the 15 sites which we have at the moment. But at the end of the day, it should be, of course, uh, extended to uh, to Australia. And, uh, and finally, and this is actually my last uh, uh, part of my, my slide here, is uh, the outcomes. I think we will be able to have the world's largest, most comprehensive skin imaging database, not just with individual tile images, but also with total body images. And, I mean, this is very bold, and uh, there are a lot of, of, of questions, and I really uh, hope that as an outcome of this discussion today, we will uh, get uh, some specific feedback on uh, specific health. Obviously, we are looking for reliable solutions for melanoma early detection, so that we get, get the melanoma at the stage where they're not melanoma, but of course, this is quite challenging from the clinical point of view, because this would mean that we excise all, all moles and all lesions who uh, are present on, on the body of, of, the, of the person. And of course, we will facilitate artificial intelligence. And uh, yeah, and as I already mentioned, the big idea is obviously to pave the, the road for a nationwide uh, screening program. There is a lot of discussion about this. Should there even be a screening wide, a nationwide screening program? Because there are a lot of opportunistic screenings already going on. But uh, I think, from a societal point of view, it is uh, at least worth contemplating a nationwide program. So thank you so much again for uh, for inviting us and share our project with us. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank thank you, Peter. And. Um, it's a really exciting project, I have to say. Great things are going to come from it. So now we're going to open things up for a, a Q and A or, or comments from anybody, both in the room and, as I said, we do have Keith monitoring what's happening online. So if, if there's somebody online and you'd like to put something in the chat, we'd certainly like to throw that into the into the mix. Um, so to start the discussion, I actually would like I'm going to start if, if people will let me do that and. Because I was struck by some of the comments, actually, that were made. And Peter's very last comment sort of reinforced it for me. And that is, we've spent a lot of time, I think, thinking about the technical, about how could we make this happen. But have we done 
their hearts and minds work to demonstrate that it should happen. So a couple of you at least said, said that. And I'd like to, I guess, ask that question. Have we done it? And if we haven't done it, how are we going to do it? I don't know if somebody would like to tackle that major problem. But. Yeah, I think we haven't done that work. I think that, um, and as a lawyer, I, I touch my microphone. I, uh, I play, take my part in that because I think that, you know, in explaining to people why information is collected, what's going to happen with, for it, and what the benefits might be, uh, I think that it, we haven't actually, uh, I know in the health sector, haven't been that transparent. We give people documents which are very densely written by lawyers. Um, and a lot of lawyers write documents that aren't really written to be read. They're not in plain English, they're quite dense. And people are often reading things in a situation where they're maybe not, they haven't got their eye on the, on the ball when it comes to privacy and data. Um, I know when I'm asked for, for medical forms, there's usually something wrong with me, and that's my main thought. And so it's not duress, but I'm not, I don't really care what the back information says. Um, we did have this uh, conversation within Lifeblood recently because we have a antibody register in WA that we're improving and we want to, uh, rather than just the blood service have access to it, let hospitals have access to it. So if someone comes in and they need blood, they can check the antibody register to make sure that there's gonna be a really good match for the patient that they've got. Like if someone has unusual antibodies, we'll know. Um, and there's a real feeling of, you know, can we, can we just take this information? Because if we ask um, donors and patients if we can have it, they might not see the benefits. In it, and they might not consent, and that's a dumb decision. If you decide not to put your name on the, not to have your information on the antibody register, and you're in an accident, and you've got antibodies, you might have a very some standard blood transfusion if you need one. Um, it's a very technical example, explained by a non-medical person. But my feeling there, my is that. The, it's not about avoiding taking the choice off someone. We haven't done a good enough job in explaining to donors and to patients why it is a fantastic idea to be included in this register. So I do think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the hearts and minds area. Public trust uh, of the, uh, the health sector, not practitioners, but the, the um, infrastructure that sits behind it, and particularly government, sorry, um, is you know that there's a low trust. Um, uh, level there. So I think, and every time that there's a breach and it's approached in a political rather than a transparent way, that adds to that lack of trust. So I do think there's a lot of work to be done around hearts and minds in this sector and in others. My, my personal sort of feeling around things like Facebook and other social media, if they had come forward, there's a lot of very low trust with Facebook and and Meta, um, if that company had said, we're going to give you a tool and it's going to be for free, other than having to look at a few ads, um, you can look at your friends' photos, you never have to sit through a holiday slideshow again because you can do it at home, um, and you can keep in contact with people around the world, we'll give you that for free, but what we're going to do is take all your data and we're going to sell it. I think people would have signed up and they wouldn't feel betrayed when later on information was being used in a way that they hadn't, um, that weren't expecting. Interesting. Can, can I just um, add a few comments? I don't, I don't think that we'll ever have achieved public trust. It's always going to be a work in progress uh, because expectations will change and people will, um, I guess something that constantly needs to be renewed. But what I think is really challenging about where we're at at the moment is if you talk to a group as as I've done before or talk to a focus group essentially about views on sharing data the views will change very rapidly within a five minute discussion so if you have someone who's quite contrary to data sharing in the room that can turn a whole room like in in sort of 15 seconds against data sharing the right advocate in the same room can actually turn it all the way back so everyone's saying why why aren't you sharing more data so that's a really challenging environment to operate in and i think um, what marion said about holding ourselves to being more transparent is the only thing is one of the only things we can do to settle those views so that they don't change so quickly. Um, and I think the, 
The other area that goes with transparency is around clarity of language. So we start using terms like identifiable data. And that confuses a lot of people. What do you actually mean by that? Well, it's not kind of identified because it doesn't have name and address on it, but you could kind of work it out. And, and um, you know, with, with um, Peter's vision there, you could um, maybe looking at the back of that person, they were maybe potentially re-identifiable. The tattoo might have helped. You turn it round. Okay, well, I think I can identify that person. But these are difficult concepts for people to understand. And until we have a better public understanding, um, of language will continue to face these issues where people get turned on and off data sharing very quickly. Thanks. Yeah. Could I just say that I don't think we should underestimate the common sense of the general public. Mm. Uh, I think that people generally speaking when they're faced with, like for Peter's example, like melanoma, I think the community understands that melanoma is a major cause of death and that something like this maybe <coughs> more systematic in assessing moles is likely to benefit them. So I think the community will understand that, the community, but the community will want to be reassured about what's happening to their data and how it's being kept safe. And I think as you've said, Philip, I've, I've sat in on focus groups as well, and, and focus groups can move quite quickly with strongly opinionated people within a small group. But there are other ways of assessing community views and I've been involved with some citizens juries which are a sort of a, a slightly longer process which start by giving a group of people some information and then enabling that to be in a non-threat environment discussed and, and out of that generally comes common sense something where the community can actually see some benefit as long as they have some reassurance about the risk so it's possible that Peter might want to actually test that with the community and it's not too difficult you could set up a focus group or maybe given the, the drawbacks of focus groups that we've talked about sometimes a survey can help because that is then just an individual fills in the survey and it's perhaps less prone to that influence or some other process so so there peter something for peter to take on board yeah, it's, it's probably worth doing actually we have already done this we have done several consumer forums and just recently we we have done a survey where we ask very specific questions and what we understand is that uh, people are quite uh, happy that the data are shared in Australia, but definitely not overseas, right? Having said this, then we have not defined overseas well enough, but uh, it's, it's a work in progress and we have actually, I'm quite proud to say that we have quite a bit of consumer involvement. But as you say, uh, Marianne, the, the consumer has really a, a lot of common sense and our consumers are mostly also people who have suffered a melanoma, had advanced melanoma. So of course they are flying the flag and this is probably also, uh, we should also look for absolutely independent consumers. So this makes sense. Thanks, Peter. Can I, can I come in? Um, uh, I, fully, I fully agree with the, with the point about uh, the general public becoming more familiar to uh, uh, to this kind of service and and, uh, and sharing and the sharing of data, uh, so we are increasingly used to wearable devices, uh, smartphones, smart watches. Uh, we get this uh, uh, notification all the time to uh, share our current location, and we make decisions every day about sharing our personal data uh, with uh, with companies. I think, I think in the case of medical research and environmental health research and public health research, it's, it's important to highlight the benefits uh, to, the, uh, to, to public health, to the population of, of sharing this data and be able to use and reuse uh, high quality data which are expensive and difficult to, uh, to collect and, and analyze. So I think the public is increasingly becoming familiar with these kind of processes and, and it's uh, it, it's uh, obviously our responsibility to uh, explain and highlight the benefits of this, of, of storing the data and sharing data. Okay, great, thanks. Questions from folks in the room? Greg? So, I think I was really heartened to hear Philip Fronte comments that uh, there's a duty to share, and that's coming from Commonwealth, and the data commissioner is, is putting that forward. Uh, I like that it's online. 
Um, so yeah, really heartened by the duty to share, uh, but we live in a, a working environment of seven jurisdictions. And you know, I work with, and, and Peter fully aware, is aware of what that means for his study across a national uh, area. And we are still struggling to get our state governments to, and our state health departments to share data, even following the sorts of user forums that Peter's had to say that the people contributing are quite happy for their data to be shared. Uh, so how do we, and we spend a lot of time in the research space addressing this issue. I, you know, I'd spend hours every week facing data, data issues and, and talking through what's the, what are the processes, what are the governance issues, and every research has to jump through those hoops. How are we going to improve that system and how can ARDC start to build a national uh, story around this? Yeah, so I mean, it, it's one of the toughest areas is actually dealing with um, the, the federated government in Australia. So that, that adds a whole new area of complexity because not only are you dealing with one layer of government who've got legislation and concerns, you're dealing actually with two every time. Um, I think I don't have a simple answer to that, otherwise we'd be in a much better position than we are. But I do think one of the things that where government works well, and we probably need to together work on how we can, can leverage this better, is government works well on precedent. You establish a precedent and quite quickly things become the norm. So I think what we're seeing at the moment um, are some really interesting projects which are targeted to particular areas of policy interest. Um, New South Wales is doing some wonderful work with the Commonwealth at the moment on a national disability data asset. So that's actually focusing on a particular area of need, establishing some of those connections and then hopefully turning those into the norms. So I think that's one of the things that we have to do is actually start showing groups that, that you can achieve something initially modest and build on it. Um, that's how the Commonwealth built MADAP, the multi-agency data integration pro project. That was starting with a small um, number of linkage linked data sets and actually showing, yes, you can do this, let's do more. But the challenge now, I think, is to um, integrate state and territory data with Commonwealth data. Um, and what tends to be the sticking point there is this kind of first mover idea of, well, I'll share my data with you if you share yours with me. Everyone agrees that we need to do it, right? That happens in principle very quickly. And then to, to characterise it really glibly is we agree, let's share data. And then there's the email from the state person who says to me, so when are you sending me the data? And I send back an email saying, oh, I thought you were sending me your data. And it's kind of sad, right? That's the impasse that we've been in for a while. Um, but I do think specific projects to create a precedent of better sharing is probably a really practical way of moving forward. Yeah. Paul? Yes, hello, Paul Bonington, Monash University. I'm just going to make some uh, additional thoughts on trust and, and thank you, Marianne, for what you're saying around the hearts and minds. I'm first and foremost a, a technologist and I've learned that the key to success of any technical ambitious project like ASMID is to appreciate that it's primarily about people, culture and policy and it's not about technology. Um, there are obviously broad challenges for, for, for those projects like ASMID, trust and awareness of a system, facility or service that, uh, from people that it's okay to use. I'd like to say that um, groundbreaking innovation and technology projects can only move at the pace of trust. There's another element to trust that I'll be kind of keen to hear from the panel your thoughts on. So we've talked about public trust, but I also think it's about stakeholder institutional trust, particularly for those complex multi-institutional programs that need to acquire and maintain the trust of the hosting institutions because at the end of the day, this is about their brand as well and their reputation. Uh, and 
that institutional trust needs to be earned, but it also needs to be nurtured continuously. So I'd be keen to hear from the panel your thoughts on that. Who would like to tackle that? I can start, because um, it's you know, a, a issue close to my heart. It's a really good point you make about, you know, the technology can move, but the trust needs to be there. But sometimes I think that the technology isn't moving as well. And so it's a vicious circle, because when the technology fails, that hurts the trust. But often with sharing, uh, if we're looking to share with someone or they're looking to share with us, there is this fear of the other side not um, having as good a standard as we do. And I think part of that is that a lot of organisations talk about privacy, but is it really at the heart of their governance and at their, um, in their corporate hygiene? Um, you know, uh, it is the privacy training for everyone at the organisation or just a few privacy officers scattered um, amongst various departments? I think businesses need to take privacy and cyber security and um, their data security as seriously as they take financial security. Um, data is an asset. It's worth a lot. Um, and so they should be putting sufficient resources and money into making sure that their practices are ahead of the game. And it's not enough to buy something in and to create a new department. It's something around embedding good privacy practices throughout the whole organisation and good ethical practices throughout the organisation. I think that's a mammoth task. And when everyone's already got quite a big to-do list, sometimes privacy is last and it's a little bit ad hoc when really it should be um, for private organisations for their boards or for the, um, the governing bodies of, of research organisations and government organisations do they have privacy specialists on the board? Um, how much time do they spend talking about privacy? I think until they, until the governing bodies spend as much time, and then that that theme and that um, th that care around privacy and data security is shared as to when you should share and how careful you should be. And I, perhaps I'm still saying when you should share because that's the sort of the word that, word that I come from. I'm all for sharing, but only if we're confident that it's within the expectation and the best interests of the person who I think owns the information, which is the person who gave it to us in the first place, who's the person that it comes from, the individual. Um, so I'd like to see a lot more time and money thrown around creating good practice, and I think the trust will come out of that. But that is a really, really hard ask in the current environment. Could I just back that up? I, I really quite agree. And I think the problem with trust is it's sort of like faith and belief, and it gets onto sort of quite difficult ground quite quickly. Whereas I think if you can bring it back to sort of information governance and the processes and the practices that are in place to manage this sensitive data, then you're on stronger ground. And I think then trust will flow out of that. I, I think that comes mm. at the end rather than at the beginning. Mm. Thanks, Mary. Got a question from online? Yes, okay, here we are. Um, so a question, we have a number of questions from online. Uh, I'll keep fire off with one of them. And this is a question to Marion and Peter. Uh, you both seem to have, to some extent, a similar question about how to enable expanded use of the data you've collected. Do you think a shared or common approach will be possible to deal with this, or will we need specific solutions for each situation? So, P Peter, I'll throw to you first, maybe, if you'd like yeah, to Yeah, look, I mean, this is obviously a very, a very difficult question. Uh, because, uh, obviously, we will have the total, total body images, we have the individual images, we will collect pathology data, where we also want to develop uh, AI based on, on, on the histopathology. Uh, and then, of course, in the background, each of us has a genetic makeup, and our makeup obviously defines what is happening with our biologic system. And, and we have researchers who are working very much in, in this field uh, on uh, the polygenic risk core. So we will have different qualities of data, which each of them actually can be identified. If you have a lot of genetic data, you can triangulate this. Not really probably with, uh, with histopathologic data, with the clinical data, this is obvious. 
And I, I mean, one of the tough questions which I have been asked when in the, the interview, they were asking me, Peter, in all fairness, the Australian AI researchers are top, but don't you think that there are even more better guys in the States or in Europe, yeah, not to mention China? Would you, would you share your data with these experts? Because as, uh, as you have uh, uh, mentioned, uh, I mean, we put literally millions of dollars into the collection of data, right? And we collect them and we will annotate them well, right? And then, of course, I think in an ideal world, they should be open under certain, uh, to, to researchers who are working in this field. But then, of course, all the researchers or many of them have in the industry connections. So it's really uh, a very complex question which I can't answer. I mean, we have various committees in place. We have a strategic advisory team. We have, we have then obviously our major universities. So there will be a lot of, of discussion. Uh, having said this, uh, we, are, we are also part and Paul knows it of, of, of the CERP project. So I am not so much concerned about the security of the data, but more than the custodian needs to decide who we allow to have access to the data. To the researcher in Canberra, yes. To the researcher in Paris, no. I mean, these are really uh, tough questions, and I do not have an answer to hmm. these questions. So can I, I think, can I add, maybe add to that question is, are we happy to allow a researcher who wants to, in your case, Peter, do BMI work as opposed to melanoma work? Yeah, so, look, I mean, I personally very, very keen about this because the strengths of the system are the longitudinal data. So it may, may well be if we, we start at the moment uh, three years of follow up. But ideally, when we get, I mean, we have an energy massive cohort grant, Torima from, from Monash, with 3.2 million. Ideally, we will get follow-up grants, right? And we will collect over 10 years, and of course, the PMI will change, right? I mean, we're all humans. And I think these are important data because the PMI is strongly correlated to the cardiometabolic uh, risk. And I think these are information where we can do research, but, but at the end of the day, of course, it has to be fed back to, to the person, to the research participant. In some way, will be often also a patient. Mm. So I, I think the data needs to be uh, feedback also so for our study participants. Mm. I think it is a really hard question, and I think that I feel like I'm giving a fudgy answer. But I think it, you can start with general principles, like you know, de-identify things as much as possible. Only ask and use what you need for the outcome that you're, you're generating. So you, you can have some um, broad principles and guardrails, but then I think you're gonna have to descend into the particular, you know, for a tool like the one that Peter was just demonstrating, that would have a very different approach from something which is more static, uh, you know, uh, information around um, answers to questions and things like that. So I think that, you know, we, we, we might have to work out, because uh, also we won't know what the potential uses are, so it's hard to anticipate them coming. But we could put guardrails in, such as, you know, if something was for uh, a publicly funded health outcome, was reproved by ethical researchers, maybe that could be within the guardrails. Um, but then what happens when it's something around a commercial um, Product, you know, maybe something like, uh, and this this is where I'm going to show I'm not a scientist or have any medical expertise, but you know, in this maybe it's a manufacturer of sunscreen wants uh, access to this data so that they can make a better product, and okay, we benefit from that product, but it's a commercial product, so is that outside the lines? So I think it's a really excellent question that the person has asked, and I, I think. We could have some guardrails, but they'll never be good enough. And every time, I think it will be up to the, um, the custodians to make a call. Uh, Amelia, if I just can say, indeed, we are, based, we are able to, to measure and eventually also automatically to assess the degree of sun damage and the area of sun damage. Actually, this can be easily extracted. And this example, which you bring with the sunscreen, um, 
industry is just one example, but then of course it goes even into into military or, or industry where people are working outdoor, right? Mm -hmm. So you could then, uh, I mean, Big Brother is watching you, right? I mean, <laughs> if you if you image uh, someone over 10 years, and then you you can even on the pattern of the sun exposure you can uh, then define if this is related to to his leisure activities because uh, of surfing or <laughs> because of the the professional exposure. So there are quite a few significant ethical questions. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, interesting. Another question from the room. So, question, um, in the university and research sector, so we've been talking a lot about uh, sharing government data previously, uh, commercialization, moving, um, uh, focusing on data custodians and their role in determining who has access to data. Uh, in the university sector, we see a lot of examples of where health consumers, researchers, data custodians uh, have agreement on a process for data sharing, on the policies for data sharing, uh, and the systems are in place and they work well. That's not across the board, but there are definitely examples out there. Um, however, in those examples where the process is falling down and falls short uh, is where the data custodians uh, and the people in the research, uh, involved in the research, know what they're doing and all agree to it and think it's a good idea to share data. And then it gets ha handed over to the lawyers <laughs> for the different <laughs> universities. <laughs> Um, and so research ideas that can take 40, 40 days for new researchers that have never met before to discuss a new project idea working over shared data can then slow down and take months or years for their lawyers at their institutions to come to terms to drafting a contract or drafting an executed data sharing agreement. So the research can effectively stop and not go ahead for what is otherwise everyone agrees is a good idea. How could that be addressed? Get a new lawyer. Okay. <laughs> uh, just make a short comment. We have to deal not just with university lawyers, which are usually, uh, they understand uh, the research questions quite well. We have also to, to deal with, uh, with the lawyers in the, obviously in the public health system, and at least in Queensland, H, uh, Health and uh, Hospital Service District is completely independent. So a lot of time is involved with discussion with, with lawyers. And the question who owns the data, obviously, is, a, is another one. Because uh, one of the other health service districts say this uh, are done as a research project within our hospital. So we own the data, and not uh, the university. So it's a, it's a very complex issue. And, and I recall well ACIF was telling us we want a port project. Sometimes I think it's, the project is too bold. <laughs> so, so Torius, could I ask you for a comment? Because I suspect this is a major issue for you. Thank, thank you, uh, absolutely. I, I think it's a very good point. And uh, I would like to point out that a lot of the research we're doing uh, is uh, international research. So uh, quite often we collaborate with uh, institutions in Asia, in the Pacific, in Europe, of course, North America. Uh, and it's, it's very challenging to uh, navigate these uh, data issues and electoral property issues uh, when we work across different uh, jurisdictions. Uh, that, that can discourage research in some cases. Uh, and um, and I, I would like to say that obviously it takes time, it takes a lot of effort to, to get this, uh, to get the legal teams to agree on the sharing of data across different countries, especially in countries with different, very different uh, uh, legal systems. Um, but it is, it is obviously very important, and, and some of the countries, uh, um, low, low, and low income countries, low mid income countries, will benefit uh, uh, even more from uh, data sharing than uh, high income countries. So it's very important to make this extra effort and, and, uh, and uh, circumvent the, the obstacles and hurdles to, to get the agreement and, and um, uh, do the data sharing, of course, you know, uh, uh, with due uh, attention to any privacy issues. 
Um, so I, th I think that's very important. And, and also I'm very clear like, that it's important to take into account uh, cultural ideas. I uh, spoke earlier in my, in my introduction about uh, uh, the importance of uh, working and involving and uh, respectfully engaging with uh, uh, indigenous populations in Australia and overseas. So I think it's very important to um, to take explicit into account any cultural like the issues uh, in relation to human data or cultural uh, knowledge uh, uh, from traditional custodians of, of this of this information and data. And, and of course, you know this complicates the process, but it's it's uh, it's uh, absolutely essential to, to do that and, and to. Um, and, and, and of course, to take advantage of the, of the knowledge that these cultures and, and different systems of knowledge can, can offer. Right, thanks. I'll just say something. Yeah. Just going to say, it, it's fundamentally important to, to listen to the lawyers because what you do with the data must be lawful. And the law is complex and it differs between jurisdictions and it differs between countries. But there is some law, for example, when you went to the last time you went to the GP and the GP wrote some notes about you. Whose data was that? Well, I think, the, and you might know better than I do, Marion, but I think the law says that that data is actually the GP's data, his professional opinion about what you've told him and he's written it down and maybe prescribed you something. So it's actually his. But then do you have some rights? So the patient may have rights, if, and, and under some legislation, patients do have rights to change things they think somebody's written down something about me and it's wrong and I'm going to tell them it's wrong. I don't think the, the person that owns the data has to actually change the data but they need to keep a record saying we think it's wrong. Hmm. So, so it's sort of complex and you need to engage that complexity rather than hope it'll go away because I don't think it'll go away. And just while we're talking about that, there is an additional complexity, which I think Satiris was adhering to, which is indigenous people and data sovereignty. So that's something that's, that's come on the scene relatively recently, but it's certainly an issue for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. It's certainly an issue for our colleagues in New Zealand and in other jurisdictions. So it's sort of an international movement about data sovereignty of indigenous people. And it's a challenge to manage in that context, but it's possible that th those ideas will spread beyond just the indigenous population. And that'll be another degree of difficulty for us, I think. Good. Can I, I just want to make one um, addition. It's kind of like this uh, mea culpa, something I've been really guilty of in the past, um, particularly when I started in the public service, was asking the lawyers the wrong questions. Yeah. Um, and and the wrong question is, can I do this using blah? Whereas the question, it's a lot more helpful if you ask the question, how can I do this legally? Because they might then look for different ways of achieving the result that you're looking for. And I actually, I reckon I wasted a year um, in the ABS when I was working there asking the wrong questions of lawyers. Mm. Um, so that that's that can really help. Um, there's some new legislation which I have to talk about, which I used to work on, the Data Availability and Transparency Act, um, no longer the DAT bill, um, which at its best will also help um, override a lot of the complex um, Commonwealth legislation which prevents sharing. Um, so you know, I'd encourage people to think about how that might actually be able to help them as well. And if I could just add to that, I think it is really important to engage with your internal lawyers. And the views I'm going to express in this bit are not lifeblood's views, but my personal view as a lawyer. I think a lot of lawyers are not well set up to assist you doing what you're wanting to do. We're taught to advocate for one party, and that's our job. And so a lot of lawyers tend to look at things sort of through blinkers. And if you ask a very tunneled question, a lawyer who doesn't perhaps have time or experience um, will stay in the tunnel rather than working with you to try and pull the question apart a little bit. Um, I, I don't think that all lawyers are actually that well suited to work in this area because it's not about, you're not negotiating with the other side to get a win, which is often how lawyer, some lawyers approach things. Um, so I, I think I would encourage people to engage early with their legal teams. Don't wait, they leave it till 4.50 on a Friday when the lawyer's already got plenty to do. And 
you know, for a lot of organisations, it's a small legal team, it's a big organisation. Your request is not going to be a priority, so it's easier to just say no and then to leave it sort of dwindling. Um, that's not good practice. Um, so I think, you know, what, as organisations, what we could do is engage early with legal teams. But I also think organisations more broadly need to, um, it, it's going back to the question we were making before about building trust, is actually equip people in privacy. So don't just get a couple of in-house lawyers to manage a, a large organisation and, and hope that they cope or use external lawyers. Um, invest in privacy professionals who can assist di different parts of the business because you're going to get a quicker um, and more nuanced uh, solution if you're dealing with a specialist and someone, and that's a specialist who doesn't just know privacy but they know you and they know your business and their way of working through. So the earlier you can plan for it, the better. And what I would say about, just to add about, it, it, that's only just on the internal, on your side, it is incredibly frustrating when you're trying, you, if you were trying to be very practical on your side and you're dealing with, say, a North American firm who are representing, and again, it might be someone very small, a small piece of their organisation, you're dealing with a lawyer and it's just not a priority for them. It's impossible to get some lawyers to move away from templates, and templates say no. So, um, the, you know, the more investment we can make in, in privacy and data, uh, the better outcomes I think you'll get. Graham, is your comment related to this? A short comment. I really like both of you, Miriam and, and Philip. I think we have to ask the lawyer the, the right question, and we really, as you, this resonates with me, we have to equip the lawyer in, in, in privacy, and this is certainly a process, and I think our our example is quite a, quite a challenging one, but uh, I think we need to address it. Thank you. So is your comment related to this, Graham? Well, it's related to the indigenous... Um, <laughs> Graham Galloway, University of Queensland. We've been talking for the last probably 10 years around there. Uh, internationally now, uh, and a lot of discussion at last year's International Council of Research Infrastructures, that it always needs to be associated with care. And I think in Australia, and I think it'd be good for ARDC to start adopting, um, let's be fair, but care, uh, approach to, to data. And that involves talking to our uh, Indigenous populations at the beginning, Hmm. not coming to them at the end and saying, oh, we've got this great project and you want us to want to join. We need to be talking to them at the beginning. How can you uh, contribute to this project and how can we work with you? So um, for those of you who haven't looked up CARE, there's a lot of work being done internationally around CARE, collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility and ethics. Uh, we, can all repro we can all repeat the, the FAIR acronym now, we need to also be uh, using the CARE Act mm -hmm. equally, just as much. Good point. Thanks, Greg. So I think we'll go online and... Go ahead, Keith. Okay, uh, so there's a whole bunch of questions online. It's quite an engaged uh, discussion also in the chat. I think so. There's a number of questions that have already been covered around changing the discussion maybe from data sovereignty about owning the data versus ideas about trust and getting sense of the trust and building uh, building trust around the data. Um, one question that sort of also came up in different forms and I think is an interesting one is um, imagine a situation in which you are gathering more data than you need for your direct use and um, uh, you're, with actual minimal effort uh, you can collect that data and bring it together. Um, that data might be of interest and use for others and for other research projects. Are we ready to aim for that added potential or do we still really need to focus on the hearts and minds and making sure that there's trust in just the basic research that can happen with the data? Yeah, I think um, a really interesting example again was the establishment of the multi-agency data integration project by the ABS. So that really kind of moved the, the Commonwealth from um, 
a single specific purpose use of a data set. So there was this kind of idea that you would actually integrate a data set um, and then it would be used for quite a specific, domain specific um, project and then it couldn't be reused again. And that was actually baked into some of the, the Commonwealth principles around data integration. And Peter Harris, who was the chair of the Productivity Commission a few years ago, um, took a very active role in, in a Productivity Commission report into data use. And he sort of said that was basically equivalent to, to burning books, only using that information once. Um, the way the ABS and others in the Commonwealth, AIHW included, have made gains in this area is through establishing very clear um, governance arrangements around these multi-use data sets. And it's not always particularly um, streamlined, but it's getting quicker over time. But it took, it took a year's worth of really hard work to actually establish arrangements that would allow for that safe reuse of information for different purposes. And again, I get to that point about um, precedent. Once you start doing a few of these things a few times and working out what works, what doesn't, and then putting solid um, documentation and governance behind it, that's really your friend, I think, in terms of being able to use data sets for more than um, we, we ever intended them to be used for. And that, that's so true of administrative data that we use in the, in the Commonwealth. You know, all of that MBS and PBS data that we talk about, that wasn't collected for research purposes. That's administrative data for administrative purposes. And now that's become the backbone of, of such a huge amount of research. And there are opportunities to keep building on those sorts of successes. Thanks, Phil. Can, can you hear me? Yep, I think. Uh, hi, Sally Pearson from UNSW. Um, I guess I just wanted to first focus back on the purpose of the panel discussion today. Uh, make a comment and then ask a question of the panel. So, um, look, I think we've been sharing sensitive and identifiable data for a very long time. Um, there are mechanisms to do that. There's safe ways to do it. Sure, we would like to, it to happen faster, quicker, more expediently, but I think we do need to acknowledge that there's great things in place that allow that to happen already. And there's some really wonderful research that has resulted from that. In my area of expertise, the world has shifted greatly. Things that weren't possible five years ago are now possible. So I think it's really important we focus on some of the good things that have happened. But I guess what, I, um, what breaks my heart is the waste of public money. And what I mean by that is how do we uplift this area so we are focused on generating high quality output for the public good rather than spending all of our time building the enabling data infrastructure. So I guess what I would like to ask the panel is if you had um, a magic wand, what would we be putting in place right here and now to uplift that so we start investing in outcomes rather than the inputs? So we've just got a couple of minutes, so I'm going to give the panellists each 30 seconds to answer that, maybe with one idea. I should have asked that earlier. There's a real <laughs> challenge. <laughs> so um, I guess we'll, we'll run through this order. I, I think actually to get maximum impact from the data that we have, we need to have, um, I hate to use this term again, uh, better data storytellers. Because we have all of this amazing information um, that's kind of hidden and inaccessible to policy makers because they're talking about the, the Bayesian ridge regression algorithm that they used and focused on that. And a lot of the time, a simple cross tab or a simple graph presented to the right person in a timely fashion makes a huge difference. So if we had more people that knew how to talk with that kind of cut through, it would make a big difference. Laws are introduced and frameworks are introduced because people don't gather themselves and do the right thing. So if I had a magic wand, I would have everyone have had appropriate um, awareness of what, how to do the right thing, and they actually do it. If people respected other people's data and how to use it and how to, how to look after it, you wouldn't need rules and frameworks or the bureaucracy that goes with it. 
Uh, my, my thinking was we have a virtuous cycle and we're sort of moving around that cycle, but, but we're not at the end yet where we don't get the benefit until that, all that data is actually used for the sorts of things that Sally's been talking about. And if I could mix a metaphor and use a Melbourne example in a, to a Sydney audience, I sort of feel that if we're, we're in the Melbourne Cup and I don't think we're in the final straight, I, I think we're sort of in the back and sort of turning the corner to a, towards the final straight of, of getting that virtuous cycle in place. So I think we need to collect the data, collect it once, use often, and, and generate the value. Satoris? I, th I think there's a lot of value in the large scale bio biomedical databases. Uh, you see the UK uh, Biobank, there are many other examples internationally. Uh, I think this is uh, a very valuable investment uh, for research and uh, for the public good. And, uh, and of course, it should be regularly updated, it should, it should be uh, augmented with uh, more focused research data. And uh, of course, uh, protocols and procedures are important, it can be time consuming, but uh, uh, it's an important requirement to uh, ensure the quality of the data and the correct use of the data. So I think it's, uh, it's an important investment for the public good. Peter? Uh, furthermore, thank you for having me. Uh, quite a few things were resonating with me. What resonated most is uh, what Philip was saying, to create a precedent, and this can change the landscape. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also, <laughs> to tell the data story even better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Peter. So I'm just mindful of the time. In, in our now Zoom world, of course, everybody online probably has a meeting in three minutes. So they're going to close this meeting and go to another one. Uh, so apologies for those people. Um, so it really just leaves me to sum up. I mean, I, I was quite struck. A fantastic conversation. I'm sure we could go on for another hour, in fact. Um, a really great conversation. So I, I was really struck by a couple of things, I guess. One of them comes down to, in fact, I think the last point that was made and the answers, and it, w it went back to the very first question, we must be able to demonstrate the value of doing this. And if we can't, we will lose the fight. Mm. It's as simple as that. And I have absolutely no doubt the battle has been won in certain areas. I would hesitate to suggest that battle has been won across the sector. And I have to say I'm absolutely delighted to hear the government is now sort of, I guess, pushing and saying, well, actually, we have to be in this space and we have to push forward and we, we have to not only help make it happen, but demonstrate that it can happen and see all the great things that come from it. So, so you know, I leave with, I guess, really hopeful. It looks like a fantastic landscape and I think we can do some, some great things. I was struck by the hearts and minds is an ongoing activity and also struck by the fact that you must resource that. So you just can't, you know, I'm a researcher, so I'm allowed to say this, you cannot leave that to the researchers, okay? We must find people who are good at messaging and get that message out there effectively. Um, a couple of other things that came up, I think the, the comments about how do we just go down the path and get it to happen? How do we make sure that we've got all the right agreements in place and we can share data effectively? We must get better at doing that. Part of that is solving the jurisdiction problem that Peter and Graham talked about. It's, you know, there are seven states. We just must have, we must have national solutions. If we're gonna solve these problems seven times, or even worse, 50 or 60 times, because of all the different health networks, we're gonna be here a very long time. And so I think one of the great challenges is to find the national solutions. Um, we didn't actually talk much about who owns the data, I have to say, but I did think the example about commercial outcomes, commercial outcomes are not bad things mm. in a lot of instances. So we should be quite open to that happening. And if it happens and you know, lots of Australians benefit from a health sense or lots of Australians benefit because a new company grows and a thousand people get employed, that's a good outcome. And so we should be ready to embrace that. So, um, so it really just leaves me now, first of all, to thank Ian and Ash and all, and all the ARDC team to put it, for putting this together. A fantastic conversation. I suspect we could do this every six months for the next five years and it would be a really rich conversation and maybe that's a great idea. I don't know, but no. <laughs> 
But there will be lots of other of these leadership series kind of conversations and I would encourage you all to, to get involved. And finally, I'd like to thank all the panelists and Peter for giving up their time and their fantastic insights. And maybe I can ask the people in the room to show your appreciation. And the people online can clap too if you want. So please stay engaged. There'll be lots of stuff happening in this space and we look forward to keeping the conversation going. So thanks everybody, take care.